What's the first step to building a thriving business, you ask? Well, getting started. And that can be scary. Whether it's quitting your day job, building your first website, or getting out there to find your first customer, simply getting started can be really intimidating. What's up, everybody? Welcome back or welcome to season two of the Inside Out podcast, all about how to build a thriving business without losing your mind. I'm your host, Ainsy. So yes, getting started can be scary, but here's a secret I learned from today's guest. You don't have to be brave all of the time, just the moments that matter. That's how today's guest, Claire Smith, managed to quit her day job to start a granola company and then scale it to over 70 stores in just three years. Claire grew up as the seventh generation on a 2,300 acre family farm in Michigan. Now she's always been really allergic to farm life especially sheep. And that's part of the reason she vowed to move as far away from the farm as she could. At one point, she thought she wanted to be a pediatric cardiologist. So she went to college at University of Michigan, ended up dropping out of the med school route, but she still graduated with a degree in neuroscience and classics. After that, she moved to Western Canada. Around the same time, her parents started pivoting the farm from corn and soybeans to more alternative grains and seeds. And ironically, they managed to convince Claire to move back to the farm. So she did that in order to work with a grain called teff. Now, teff is native to Ethiopia. If you've ever been to an Ethiopian restaurant, you know that injera bread they serve that's like really spongy and you have it with all the amazing sauces. That bread is made out of teff, which is what Claire works with. At first, she tried a bunch of different recipes and there's a funny story she tells about why teff energy bites do not work out. After a bunch of recipes, she ended up with teff granola or tefola, and she started selling to local grocery stores back in January 2018. Since then, she's grown tefola into 70 grocery stores and coffee shops around Michigan, and she's expanding now to Chicago and Toledo, Ohio. Today, Claire's going to share her business journey from late nights and farmer's markets to building a customer-centric food brand that brings awareness to small farmers and ancient grains. I actually tried my first sample of tefola the other day, and it was not what I expected, in a good way. The texture is sort of light, but it's still filling, and I got the berry burst flavor, and it was slightly savory, which was the surprising part. And I think that comes from the lavender and poppy seed flavors. If you're looking for a new breakfast food to try out, definitely check out Tefola. One last thing before we dive in. If you enjoyed today's episode, I would love to know what you took away from it. Take a screenshot of the podcast and tag me in a story. I'm at Inside Out with Jane. All right, enjoy the show. Welcome to the podcast, Claire. Thank you for having me. I'm excited. You'll have to excuse me for my messy hair. I was trying to go for a farmer chic look today. Oh, it is very like rustically like I just came in from like the chicken coop gathering eggs. I appreciate it. (laughs) Um, Yes. (laughs) Yeah, I'd love if you could introduce yourself, tell us a bit about your background and growing up on a farm. Okay, so I grew up in the middle of nowhere in southern Michigan, and I'm going to show you. It's a very Michigan thing, so like, don't freak out, but like, this is my hand for the podcast people, (laughs) and we are down here because Michigan is shaped like a hand, and so we're like down Mm -hmm. here. Detroit's like over here. So we were like, our farm is a seventh generation family farm, and we're on about 2,300 acres, and so I grew up there um, with chickens and sheep and some horses and some goats and learned a lot about the circle of life. (laughs) Um, But growing up, I'm the third of seven kids. Um, Big family. Yeah, there's always something going on. Like our group chats now with like everyone grown up and, you know, some are married. And our group chat is now just our immediate family with like spouses is 12 people. Oh, my. So I guess it is kind of like a lot. <laughs> um, <laughs> never so a dull moment. <laughs> never, 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 ever. And so, yeah, I didn't like the farm at all. I was far away from my friends, far away from like the city. And I thought like the only city worth going to was New York, mm. which really doesn't make sense. Um, <laughs> but there's a lot of cities. But um, yeah, I always wanted to go be a doctor 
specifically a pediatric cardiologist. At the age of 10, I was reading this book and the main character was a pediatric cardiologist. Oh. And it was at this like very, like the stars aligned or something. And my, as I was reading it, my dad asked me what I wanted to be when I grew up. And I thought like this main character was just like super inspiring and loved his patients, all these sorts of things, worked really hard, had fulfillment, like all the positive wow. things you want out of a yeah. career. And I thought that like I was 10 years old. I didn't know any better, but I thought you had to be a pediatric cardiologist, like to find joy in life. life. Oh. Right. Like, Oh, baby Claire. <laughs> like we have so much to talk about anyway. So, um, I said, Oh, like I want to be a pediatric cardiologist. And, mm. um, I guess I don't know how I would react if my 10 year old said that, but like, it was very evident that that is a very positive, good thing to aspire to because that is kind of impressive. So for the next 10 years, um, that was the goal. That's what I told everyone. That's what I studied in university. So I went to university of Michigan and studied neuroscience with a minor in classics. And I, it was just like, <laughs> I'm a terrible student. I worked really hard in high school. So I got into Michigan by the skin of my teeth. Um, and I was yeah, just like not a good student. Yeah, I was really, I would never get in now. And I barely got in then. Um, <laughs> but it was four years of like getting C's and D's and failing classes. Like mm -hmm. I failed, I think six classes. Like I retook genetics twice. I retook physics twice, took biochem twice and just like all these really hard classes. And it was like, November of my junior year, I was walking to the bus stop to go to the library to pull another all nighter to study for an exam. I wasn't ready for the next day. And it just finally hit me. I don't know where it came from, but it was just like this very clear, I don't have to be pre-med if I don't want to be. Mm. And it was like the biggest mindset shift to date. <laughs> like it just suddenly like everything crumbled after that because I didn't know what I wanted to be, mm. but it was like, you have to like crumble and like surrender not to get super woo woo, but like, you just have to be like, you know what? Like that would be the wrong path for me. And like, if I'm not passionate about medicine and pre-med and these classes, like then clearly it's not what I'm meant to be doing. Like, because if I were meant to be doing this and if I were called to this like profession, it would be a lot easier and I wouldn't be like crying on my floor trying to figure out like the Krebs cycle. So <laughs> yeah. I was also pre-med for a hot second before mm -hmm. I realized that A, I'm deathly afraid of blood and B, my family doctor told me he was like, you know, it's like a 10 year journey that you can't turn back <laughs> on and basically discouraged yeah. me. I don't know what it is about medicine that like so many of us get it drilled into us that that's like the road for us. It seems like, like as kids, I only knew like four or five professions, right? Mm. Like teacher, farmer, doctor, lawyer, because my dad's also a lawyer and like politician because they're mm. politicians in my family or like there were just like a very limited amount of possible aspirational careers yeah. it's like I just didn't know and so like I picked the one that like sounded impressive sounded different because I like being a little different and there are no doctors in my family and so I just think we need to like tell kids like and even like into high school I didn't know like it was like oh you could be an engineer too and it's like well I'm I don't like engineering and maybe it's because I went to a really small high school like there were 17 kids in my graduating oh class my God. Like a super small school <laughs> right like super super small and maybe we just weren't exposed to enough stuff even though my parents tried very hard to expose me to like life outside of our tiny town mm -hmm. it's got to be more of like showing kids like students that there's so much more out there yeah um, definitely. and then you can't just like shove someone into college because society definitely like shoves people into college and says that's the right way to go and then just be like, okay, well, you have to know what you want to do by like 20 at the absolute latest, because you have to declare a major. And also this is going to impact the rest of your life. And also like, 
um, your worth is 100%. Well, at least in my case, I thought my worth was um, based on my grades. So there was a lot of difficulty in kind of unlearning that and Mm -hmm. that there is a whole world out here where grades really don't matter at Mm -hmm. all. And I just didn't know that. Yeah, such a huge misconception. Like if you want to become a researcher or a professor, like those matter, but literally anything else in the world, like your GPA just does not matter. Mm -mm. It really doesn't. And I want to go back and tell Claire, past Claire, so many things, like so many things. But I think if I could only pick one thing, it would be your worth is not measured by what your GPA is or what your professors say about you, or even what your teachers say about you, like Mm. back in high school, and you control the narrative. Mm -hmm. Like you choose your own happiness, and you can control what what you want your life to be, or how you react to what life hands you. Did you ever see yourself moving back to the family farm? Because last time we talked, you mentioned you get bad allergies. (laughs) Yes. Is that still a thing? Um, yes. And although I've heard about these like allergy shots, but mm-hmm. I, yes, I'm very allergic and I did not expect to come back to the farm, which is like partially because of allergies, because I walk into the barn and like dust and hay, sheep in general, <laughs> horses as a whole, <laughs> like just really make me react, which oh, is no. really funny given the profession that I have chosen. <laughs> exactly. but, um, but after school, I kind of did a little bit of um, soul searching. So I went to Mississippi and did AmeriCorps, which is kind of like the domestic version of the Peace Corps. Then I went to Canada and worked in retail, which was fascinating. I was in Western Canada and then my parents came to visit and they said, hey, we have this um, new idea, new grain that we want to grow. And if you are interested in coming back to the farm and maybe starting something with it. We don't know if we can grow it. We don't know if we can do anything with it, (laughs) Um, but there's opportunity here and you could build something from it if you wanted to. I'll remember that conversation forever because it was very life-changing. And what made me say yes was the absolute happiest I was, was when I was crossing the border into Canada for the first time. And I was driving with all of my worldly belongings in my like station wagon. And I didn't have a job yet. I only had an address of where I was staying. And I crossed in Saskatchewan, which is prairie, which is just wide open flatlands, fields. And it just felt like the world was filled with possibility and potential. And I could do whatever I wanted. Um And just like the great unknown of what was coming next was just a really happy feeling for me. And so I knew that going into this type of unknown of TEF and this ancient grain that we might be growing and it might work and you might be able to build a business out of it. I don't know, like all these unknowns and potential and possibility was just a really attractive thing to me. And to this day, that unknown it draws me a lot because it's just like anything could happen, like literally anything could happen, which I think is really cool. And I understand that other people might be terrified by that, but <laughs> like there's a reason all of us are different. Like it's very good that all of us are very different. But for me, it's just that's like the most exciting thing there is, is yeah. a big question mark. Yeah, mm-hmm. you're a pioneer. <laughs> your your parents planted the seed of an idea around Tef yes. and then, you know, you pack your bags, you go out on the prairies and you, you know, plow and then the I land. Got... <laughs> There's yeah. so many farm I... puns. Oh, there are so many. I mean, I got on the grain train mm. right back home. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. It's the worst. <laughs> it's the worst. I love puns. Um, so, yeah, so I moved back in 2015 and I got a day job and started kind of working on this and learning what teff is. Um, and it's an ancient grain from Ethiopia, really good for you. Lots of protein, fiber, calcium, iron, that kind of thing. And Ethiopians use it to make injera, which is like a sourdough fermented bread that they eat like 
two or three times a day. So it's very popular there, but um, it was pretty much unheard of. Is in, that similar to like, the uh, like Ethiopian bread that you get? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Ah, yeah, that's, that's it. Like yeah. A little so, bubbly. Yes. A little spongy, ah. little like sourdoughy. Mm -hmm. Cool. So like Ethiopians, obviously like in the, in the States know what it is, but not, it's not a normal grain yeah. in American culture. Um, like quinoa is now mm. like quinoa is like a pretty accepted understood grain. I so mean, actually it's the seed, new but anyway, um, Tef is like, going to be the new quinoa yes it is Ooh. i'm going to make it the new quinoa yes, so. <laughs> let's go how did your parents find out about it okay so a friend of ours works in africa in agriculture like the northeast like where ethiopia is and he heard about our corn and soybean woes so up until 2015 we'd pretty much only grown corn wheat soybeans and a couple of cover crops but he suggested that we try growing this because prices were falling. And my dad was like, well, we're going to have to do something. And it might be selling land, which is not something you want to do as a farmer. And so he said, you know what, let's just like try this obscure ancient grain, see if it works and a uh, player will help. And our plan was to figure out how to grow it, figure out how to harvest it, find someone to clean it find someone to mill it and then sell it to Ethiopian restaurants because they make injera. And somehow all of that we ended up doing, even though we didn't know wow. any of it in the beginning, which was really impressive on my dad's side. Like it's a very difficult crop to grow. It's not acclimated to Michigan climate. Michigan climate is um, hot and sometimes cold. It's very, very humid because of the Great Lakes. Mm. The soil content is just completely different. We have a mm. lot of clay in our area. Whereas like Ethiopia and Nevada, where teff is also grown in the States, it's very hot, very dry, very sandy. And so it was a lot of unknowns, but we pushed forward, got our teff flower onto Amazon and just didn't see a ton of traction mm. after like a year. <laughs> well, probably and no so, one's searching for it, right? Right. No one's searching for it. And I didn't know what I was doing. Like, I was like, oh, I'll run some ads. And like ads mm. kind of worked, but like our packaging was not great. And I was reaching out to bloggers and being like, hi, can you use this really obscure gluten-free <laughs> flour that tastes kind of nutty in like your stuff? And like, bloggers are expensive and mm -hmm. like it didn't translate to sales and we had like no presence and it just wasn't working. And so I took to the kitchen and the idea was, okay, I'll make like baking mixes out of this flour and then we'll sell the baking mixes. And so I am not like that type of recipe developer, like <laughs> trying to get like a flour, a gluten, like textured gluten-free flour is like really difficult and like there are whole teams of people mm. who are dedicated to that now but i was like trying to do it in my kitchen which just like did not work so i wasn't seeing a lot of success and then one day i took the whole grain teff which i had a sample of like from the farm to show people what we were doing and i put it into this granola and the flavor was really interesting and so I tweaked it again, only using ingredients that were in my pantry at the time. So like pumpkin seeds and sunflower seeds and shredded coconut and maple syrup. Um, like I'm Canadian. So of course I have maple syrup on hand. So threw stuff into a bowl, including the whole teff grain, um, baked it. And then I kind of tweaked the recipe a couple more times, adding like a few more pumpkin seeds because I really like pumpkin seeds and get over to my sister who I was nannying for at the time. And I was like, I made this for you. Aww. Like here, try it. Um, and she and her husband ate a pound of granola in two days, oh, which boy. is like an obscene amount of granola in my personal <laughs> That's opinion. That's a lot. And there was a decent amount of fiber in there. So I was like, oh. concerned for their gut health. <laughs> Around this time, I thought, had this brilliant idea. I was going to turn teff into like energy bites. And so I blended like dates and cacao and chia seeds and coconut oil and cooked teff grain 
into this energy bite Mm. and I thought it was going to change the world I was so convinced and I was like oh yeah we're going to be in Starbucks it's like of course this is going to be the best energy bite ever and I was giving it to friends and they were just like it's nice Claire Uh and I'm like you don't understand you just like you don't get it like you just don't get it like this is the best thing ever anyway so I gave some to my like cornal blue trained aunt and I was like hello try this and she like called me a couple days later after she got it and she's like hey Claire yeah um I put them in the fridge like waited a couple days because like I just didn't get around to eating them and I took them out and they smell like alcohol what (laughs) One of the properties of teff and like how it's able to be fermented is that it has naturally occurring yeast on it oh. and the yeast mixed with the water from cooking the teff mm-hmm. mixed with the sugars of the date oh um, makes alcohol which is spoiler alert for anyone listening who doesn't know how alcohol is made you need yeast sugar and water <laughs> um, so you so were making I, like alcoholic energy bites yeah I mean, that could have taken off as a thing. Okay, right. So (laughs) for April Fool's Day this year, we told people we were launching Tefola Boozy Bites. (laughs) And people like actually really liked the idea. Oh my God. Okay, guys, this is an April Fool's, but maybe we do need to make this a thing now. Yes. Um, Anyway, so I was on this whole like, these energy bites are going to change the world. So I signed a contract with a commercial kitchen, like a shared kitchen. Um, do not recommend that. Also, Mm. I didn't have the recipe fully done. Right. And I was like thinking that everything would be fixed if I tweaked, you know, the amount of chia seeds by two grams. Spoiler alert. That is not how that works. (laughs) And so meanwhile, I'm selling this granola to my sister. Was not thinking very business like there. So I posted a picture of the granola to Instagram and the owner of the kitchen where I had just signed the contract and forked over like $500, which is a decent amount of money for me then and now for something (laughs) pretty unknown. Mm -hmm. She called me and was like, you should make granola. Like those bites are kind of difficult and like no one knows what they are. You should try granola. And Mm. I'm like, "Uh, okay, sure. So that was it. We got our license like a couple weeks later, like from the health department, we started selling at this like ice festival thing in December. And then in January, we got into our first local grocery store. And that was November of 2017. Wow. That was, it was so long ago. I was such a baby. I didn't know how to do anything. I was making (laughs) labels at like the library computer. I was printing invoices at the library because I didn't have a printer. And I put my stuff on Etsy the day that we got the license because you can't sell anything online if you don't have a license. Mm. And within an hour of like posting it to Instagram or whatever, we got our first order from a stranger. (gasps) Yes. And I will never forget Kathy. Like she still follows me and she's still like. How did she find you? No idea. To this day, I have no idea. Oh my gosh. (laughs) How do people Um, normally find you guys? like in the beginning it was like farmers markets Mm. or someone told them about it now it's becoming the fact that like people see us in multiple stores and then online people usually find us online through like all of my friends that I post and like my Mm. network of people would they get outside of that food world to like meet other people because not everyone is in a food world that our website and we're just becoming more involved in like other things now so I'm in this grain group called the artisan grain collaborative Mm. and it's all about grains in the upper midwest and so that's been amazing because like there's more sources for local grains and supplies for local grains which is something that we are casually all about (laughs) we (gasps) celebrate grains whereas a lot of other companies like are very much so like oh we're grain free because grains Mm. are bad and that's just not the case yeah well it's more that just too much wheat grain right and we need to diversify our intake of grains Um, tell me more about this local local thing like what can you grow in michigan and i think last time we spoke you hit a big milestone in terms of local was it sourcing oats locally yes um So Michigan is the second most agriculturally diverse 
state in the country. So California is first and Michigan is second. Hmm. So we can grow a lot of things. We cannot grow avocados, but we can grow like anything from like sugar beets are a really big app uh, for us. Obviously we can grow corn and soybeans, wheat, uh, alfalfa, oats, sorghum, teff, millet, buckwheat. And those are just like grains. Mm. Um, there's also the indigenous communities in the UP, which is like the upper peninsula, they have wild rice hmm. and that's like truly rice from the wild, which wow. is really cool. Is that like the purple um, rice? Yes. It's like, it's like almost black. It's mm. like, yeah, it's really, really dark, but that's cool. like naturally occurring in the wild. Like that's why it's called wild rice. It's not wow. just like, oh, these are some wild colors. <laughs> it's like, and like it's both. The, it's it's both. But like they're it and I'm literally just learning about this, but I didn't know that the UP, which is very, very cold and like has a very short growing season, can grow rice. Like mm. I thought rice had to be like very warm climates, all these sorts of things. I guess I don't know a lot about rice. Mm. But um I literally just learned that um, the indigenous communities are growing or harvesting wild rice, which is really, really cool. Wow. Um, anyway, so there's tons of fruits and veggies. We are very well known for cranberries and cherries. We're the cherry capital of the world. Um, so yeah, a lot of really cool things. And actually, speaking of local sourcing, this is Friday. <laughs> I have searched high and low for food grade lavender oil. Hmm. And Michigan has a lot of lavender farms, which again, I didn't really know about until recently, but a lot of the oil that they distill is more for like diffusing or like to put in soaps or like lotions. Mm. But I finally found a farm that can distill it for food grade, like lavender. And we use lavender in our berry burst flavor, Ooh. and which is strawberry, lemon, lavender, and poppy seed. And the lavender oh, yeah. just has this amazing floral um, note to it. We don't use a lot. So it just lifts up the berry and the citrus and just, it feels like sunshine. <laughs> like that's <laughs> how someone described our product Aww. to us. They were like, this is like sunshine on <sighs> a summer day. And I'm like, that's what I was trying to do. Oh, print that <laughs> out on a poster. <laughs> like, I know. It was oh, so I love cool. That. It was completely unprompted, like. I hadn't talked to her in ages. It's like an old friend, right? And she's like, hey, this tastes like sunshine. And I'm like, oh, you're yeah. right. You're right. So, um, and those are just like such, I know we talked about branding at some point and maybe we will, but like, it's just such a cool branding moment where you are so in tune with your creativity and when it aligns with your customers and like, like all there, like the emotions you want your customer to feel is what they felt. It was just a really amazing, it was a really cool moment of like, okay, I am doing this right. And like validation, there's not a ton of it as a business owner, but those are the types of validation where it's like, yes, I'm early on and maybe only a handful of people really get it, but I'm doing the right thing. I just need to find more people. <laughs> yeah, local sourcing, we're super excited about it. And the lavender oil is very cool, but the oats, which are one of the ingredients that we use the most of, we are so close. And that recipe development project that I mentioned, project will have Michigan grown oats and Michigan rolled oats Ooh. and baked into the final product in Michigan, wow. which is really cool. Full circle. I'm, it's going to be so much fun. I'm so excited because like our farm, like the whole point of it was to show people like we are a small farm. We're also a large farm to some people. And so we are way too big to be going to farmer's markets. Like we have many tractors and that kind of thing and 1100 acres of crops to like land to plant. But we're also too small to really be competing with the big players, like the big grain players who have tens of thousands of acres. And so I created this product to bring awareness to those small farmers and like showing other farmers that there's a way you can pivot your farm from the traditional cash crops of corn and soybeans. Mm -hmm. You can pivot to these alternative grains and seeds. Our whole ethos is one ingredient per product will be sourced from our farm and all of our grains will be sourced from, if not Michigan, the upper Midwest. 
we don't see that type of celebrating of grains. And these are all, this isn't like conventional hyper GMO ified like grains. These are ancient grains like teff and sorghum and millet and specifically gluten-free grains. So yes. buckwheat has been just a really cool seed because it is technically a seed to work with. Um, and there's so much you can do with it. And the innovation around TEF has really not even started yet. There's so much to do with TEF. And I'm excited to see more chatter about it. People are starting to talk about it and use it in like pancake mixes, like use the flour. And I have so many ideas, so many exciting things I want to do. I feel like it's you just, guys need cool. to release a cookbook uh, <laughs> oh, gosh. or like a, like a recipe book. Cause I, so mm -hmm. I'm gluten-free and I'm always looking for like other grains to try like pretty limited these days to mm -hmm. rice, whatever gluten-free bread whole foods is selling. And like, mm -hmm. I guess there's more options now with like cauliflower crust and like, you know, plant-based things. Well, and it's, I mean, I am mostly plant-based myself, except for like creamer in my coffee, but like a lot of like plant-based products out there are just like filled with other stuff that mm. isn't ideal. So like I try to avoid gums and like maltodextrin and like all these okay. sorts of things where they're like, how do we take pea protein and turn it into a creamer that doesn't like separate in someone's coffee and it's more of a single ingredient kind of person I'd mm. rather have a single ingredient than something super super processed mm, that and makes so, sense yeah like yeah. the impossible burger it's like mm -hmm. yeah it's plant-based but there's probably a bunch of junk in it that like you don't want in yeah. your body and like I'm a huge fan of you know less of the Amazon being cut down <laughs> like a big fan yes. really big fan <laughs> but for like and I it's great like being vegan or even vegetarian is better for the earth all these sorts of things like animal cruelty all these things right but like for your own personal health like maybe that's a stepping stone mm -hmm. to a whole food plant-based diet where you're making lentil burgers or mm -hmm. like black bean burgers instead of impossible burgers i think it's amazing what they're doing it's so cool that they have exploded in growth because it just raises more awareness that, yeah, more people are interested in, you know, not animal products. And like, it's all intuitive. Listen to your gut. It will really? tell you if it likes something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have a lot to say about this. This could be a whole nother episode because I used to be vegetarian, then vegan, then raw vegan. I kind of just like went mm -hmm. straight for the, the most extreme. And I think that ruined my gut health a bit. And also I have so many thoughts. Yeah. And also my ethnic background is Chinese and like vegetarianism isn't really a thing unless you're Buddhist. And so it would just be really awkward at family gatherings and dinners mm -hmm. where like I could only eat half the things. And in our culture, it's, it's kind of seen as rude if you don't accept the food and like you don't show appreciation for for it. All those reasons combined together, mm -hmm. I decided to go back to eating meat. Um, and, and I think my body feels better for it too, but you know, as much as I can, I try to support the new plant-based businesses yeah. coming out. This is so funny. We have like very similar backgrounds. So I used to work at a raw vegan restaurant, mm. um, and I was like their part of their food person. So I would develop new recipes like aside from juices, like green juices, like their philosophy, like, or, and we use the dehydrator a lot, mm. but their raw vegan was like based around the philosophy of 80, 10, 10. So 80% mm, yes. of your <laughs> calories were from carbohydrates, mm -hmm. which is essentially fruits and sweet potatoes in that restaurant. And like, after making so many smoothies that were like, banana based or mango and banana based with like orange juice added like they're objectively very good mm -hmm. but like <laughs> eating that way because like you're eating from the cafe a lot especially in the early days of just like opening the restaurant all these sorts of things like I got so bloated my stomach mm. hurt constantly and like my skin very much so reacted mm. and I felt awful and I went to my nutritionist dietitian and she was like, you need to stop eating so much sugar. And I'm like, but it's fruit. <laughs> right? um, and it's like, it's still sugar. Dude, like, just, it's still sugar. And just like, 
back away. Yeah, (laughs) I I totally bought into that. I was like all over. Did you ever see Raw Christina on YouTube? There's (laughs) there's like this whole, she's like, oh, I I went 80, 10, 10, and now my eyes are blue. (laughs) I am deceased. Stop it. She actually said, oh my gosh. Uh, I have nothing but respect for the YouTubers, but like, listen, like, everyone is built differently yeah. like don't say like like eat like me look like me that is not how that works that is so not how that works yeah and like anyway, when I was 19 I didn't know any better impressionable <laughs> youths exactly <laughs> it's not our fault not our fault we thought college was a good idea and <laughs> a raw vegan lifestyle <laughs> and my have we grown <laughs> yes I want to go back to the point you made about branding, because I think you have a really interesting take on how you see the Tefola brand as not just like, you know, the color and the logos, but how you interact with your customers. Can you speak on that? Yes. So first and foremost, our mission uh, behind our company is to be bold in flavor and brave in character. And that drives every single decision we do. It is very much so part of where we are trying to go and has really crafted a lot of strategy and decision making. But another part of that, so that's like the business reason behind having a vision and a mission, but the branding side of it is like, that's, it goes back to how you want your customers to feel when they interact with your brand. And so a lot of times I see people and business owners, and like, I thought this too in the beginning, thinking that colors, icons, and fonts, and logos, and a pretty website where branding is. And that is a part of branding. Mm -hmm. That is a substantial part of branding. But branding starts the minute you make a product and put it on the marketplace. It even starts before that. Like, every single touch point you have with a customer or a potential customer or a potential vendor or supplier or partner, every single touch point is your branding. And so it's truly something that you have to embody and just fully be. Like if you are your brand or if you are crafting a persona of your brand, like you've got to get super specific and be that brand, at least for me, like I have chosen to like my brand and I are very, very closely aligned, which is, again, these are all like, if you own a business, like it's up to you do whatever you want. It's your company, but like ours are very closely aligned. And so it's a lot easier for me to just fully be my brand because it's pretty much me. In fact, I would very much so argue that Tefola has made me a braver and, um, much more confident person because of what it requires. Like, how do you want people to see you as a brand? How do you want people to talk about you and your brand to other people? Which a lot of that was answered in my hundreds of hours of conversation at demos and farmers markets and talking to customers um, in exchange for a donation to their favorite charity. Like I did that a lot. Like I'd say, hey, I'll give 25 bucks to your favorite charity if we can just talk for an hour and listen to them and learned not only like if they liked Tefola, but what their hobbies were, like what they like about the town they live in or what their habits are, that kind of thing. And so like I keep saying this and I it bears repeating, like how do you want your people to feel? Do you want them to feel like, you know, like, cozy and warm and oh like and taken care of or luxurious and like do you want them to feel like they just walked into a five-star hotel or do you want them to feel like relief that something isn't like super expensive so it's affordable so it fits into their lifestyle so they can focus on other things like are you going more the convenience route or are you going super inspiring which is kind of where we're going where we encourage people that you are bold and brave. In our story, my dad made this big decision that has had tremendous impact. And you can make, not every decision you make is going to be as giant as that, but you are bold and brave enough to make that step if you need to. So we are really about 
encouraging others to push outside of maybe their comfort zone kind of thing. But that feeling, we knew that very early on. We knew that when it came to designing our packaging and our whole brand suite, you could say, with our colors, we still only had one flavor. But when I went to my designers, I said, like, this is how I want them to feel. I want them to feel very, like, youthful and energetic and excited and just intrigued and like they're trying something new and like different and like I kept coming back to like we're a little bit different and Mm -hmm. like that energy that I think is required to do (laughs) big bold scary things like you don't have to be what's that there's like a phrase out there where it's you don't have to be like brave for a very long time You just have to be brave for the 10 seconds it takes to start, um, Mm -hmm. which I have found to be true multiple times. Anyway, so I told this to my designers and they totally got what we wanted, which was really cool. If you are nervous about talking to someone in a room, especially this is especially for like networking or pitching yourself, that kind of thing. You don't have to be the most brave, courageous person on the whole entire planet for like the 10 minute conversation. You just need to be brave enough and courageous enough for the 10 seconds it takes to walk up to the person and say, hi, my name is Claire. I really admire your work. Mm. Do you mind answering a few questions? Mm. Like, that's it. Like, that's it. And then you know what? If they say yes, great. Like, that's when you let your like all of your preparation kind of were like, that's when you brave part of you has done its job. It got you into the position and the situation that you wanted to be in. And then your preparedness, your intellect, your skills, whatever can step in and take over. Mm. Um, so I love that. that was the context was like talking to someone new, but I like so relevant to so many things like, yes, networking and pitching yourself to new stores or people, but also like on a broader level, starting a business. Like if I knew how difficult it was going to be, like if anybody knew how difficult starting a business was going to be and building something that's as big as what we want to build, they probably wouldn't do it. Like it's really difficult. Or I would shy away from it or be like well I'm not ready like I'll go to school again and Mm. hope that that prepares me for me it was like a couple months maybe of being brave enough to be like okay there's something here there's something here like this seems to be working and then a mentor so like that was between like November when we started to the summer Like just kind of like, oh yeah, this is kind of like a side thing that I'm really downplaying it and just like, I don't want to say not taking it seriously, but like holding back. Mm. And I went on this life-changing trip and it was just to like our cottage. And my uncle said, what are you so afraid of? Like, why are you holding back? What is stopping you from going all in? And in a very rare moment like I was actually speechless like I could not think of why that was the case and so I thought about it went home and in three weeks I quit my day job launched my website and signed on a business partner and all of those things were kind of in the works like they were like oh yes like I'll do those things eventually Mm. the 10 seconds it took or you know 10 minutes it took to write the email, quitting my day job, the two seconds it takes, press publish on a website. Mm. You don't have to be brave for the rest of your life. You just have to be brave for the parts to get you to where your preparation can take over. Love that. Yeah. Cause if you've already done the prep work, you know, the rest mm-hmm. will take over and you just have to take that leap. And I love that. Well, so and much. speaking of how I built this, like, of course, his question is like, is it luck or your skills and hard work, Mm -hmm. like lucky being born into the family I did, into the time that I did, into like country, all these sorts of things. I have a lot of privilege, like that's luck. 
Mm. You can always add more skills, but the more, the harder you work, the more opportunities you have. But I think like so much of it does tie into the work you put in, right? Like an opportunity comes up because of luck. Like you have to be the one to seize that opportunity, mm -hmm. right? Like it's not going to mm -hmm. take itself and you've, yeah. you've taken those leaps. Um, Another book that I read was like, is it smarts or luck? And he was like, I was smart enough to know that I was lucky. Mm. So I think everyone has luck and influence and it just kind of is a certain perspective to see it. And maybe this is all wrong. I would love if someone was like, you're dumb. You have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> like here's X, Y, Z examples. Highly but doubt like that, but to provide some perspective, like how much work are you putting into Tefola like on a daily basis and how long have you been working on it now? Uh, okay. So yesterday was not a normal day. I will prep. I worked, um, 17 hours yesterday. Oh, geez. Um, so again, that's not a normal day. Most days I'm working between 10 to 12 hours um, during the week and like weekends I try to take a bit more time off usually Sundays I'm really working hard not to respond to emails I am not very good at that but here we are <laughs> I'm trying <laughs> been full time since September of 2018 wow. so almost three years being full time I will never forget that Monday that first day of working for myself we got into three more stores that day and speaking this is so funny that we were talking about that you know 10 seconds of brave because I walked into like my only store at the time and it had three other locations and I really wanted to be in the other three locations and I saw the owner of the store who I had met once like ages ago I saw him in the store checked on my product like tweaked the lines or whatever like made it look pretty and saw him and left the store because I was scared of him mm. like actually 100% scared I was very intimidated by him and I'm like walking out of the store and I literally stopped in my tracks that is a phrase for a reason in that moment I knew that what I wanted to be in the other three stores was a bigger feeling than me being scared of him and really intimidated by him and so I turned around again like summoning every ounce of courage because I was very scared of him I don't know mm. why he's very nice <laughs> but anyway I walked up to him and I was like hi I'm a vendor vendors I'd like to be in all four of your stores that's literally what I said to him and he like looks at me and he's like <laughs> sorry, who are you? <laughs> and he's like, what do you sell here? And I'm like, and that's when like my like self take, take over because like I knew the answers to his questions, right? Mm -hmm. Like we could talk about branding and like the story of the product and that's just the back of your hand. It was just that moment of stopping and turning around and walking up to him and saying that sentence we walked over to my shelf, looked at the product and I, we negotiated a price and I was like, I want to be in your other three stores. And he was like, well, you got to do better for me on price. And I said, fine, this price. And he's like, mm, how about this price? <laughs> um, and we shook on it. And the next day I dropped off product at the other three stores. So wow. yeah, it like, and that was just such again like you look for these small moments of validation as a business owner you're not going to get a ton but like that was a moment of yes it was the right thing to quit the day job and like I was not financially ready to quit my day job but mm. um it's like well would you be as successful as you are now and like would you have the growth and the opportunities you have now if you had quit to quit your day job until you were financially stable and also what does that look like for you? And just a lot of qu questions around it. I mean, yes, there has been a lot of stress around money and finances for the business and for me personally, because I am single, I live alone, I live and breathe this all the time. Mm -hmm. I should say that's an important, like, I don't have any kids. I don't have a significant other. Like I, pour everything that I am into this I'm lucky that I have that the time to dedicate to it but it's also like really difficult to pull away mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah so 
Yeah, because um, it sounds like Claire and Tafola are one right now. Like you've kind of merged, yeah. right? And this goes back yeah. to what you were saying around branding and that like the mission and values like you hold dear um, and for the company um, tent with that being the case and, and able to like stay sane and stay whole as a person. <laughs> um, yes, Tafola has gotten bigger and bigger meaning there's more people in our community. So we have three part-time employees right now. So one marketing intern and two baking assistants or like baking people. And we have a group of brand ambassadors and we're in, you know, 60 to 70 stores. We are sold online and subscriptions and all these sorts of things. So as Tefal has gotten bigger, it has its own personality. Like it's not like it's outgrown me by any means because we are, I am very much so still driving the ship, but sure. um, gotten to be bigger than me. Like people may not necessarily love me, but they love Tefola, which is like, not sure why you don't love me, but like, that's fine. <laughs> love on Tefola. They'll get there. Care. They'll get there. <laughs> right. That needs, it's, really cool to see this starting to take shape and people making it their own. And we are just at the mere hintest of beginnings of that. It's almost a relief. It's bittersweet. I think seeing it grow because just those early days of me in my room doing website updates at two in the morning, or we're really integral to who I am now. And very important to the development of the company. And it's just like, yeah, those days are kind of done now. And I don't miss those early, early days. I really, I don't. It was, we were in our own little world and I constantly refer to Tefola as my significant other. Like we're in a very long-term relationship. We're very committed to each other. Um, still very dependent on each other, which, <laughs> but it, then it was just us and, the world with like me and my wild dreams and wild ideas and just now it's becoming other people's ideas right and that's a good thing not all of my ideas are good in fact <laughs> a lot of them are really bad like <laughs> I'll tell you one really terrible idea that I had I was convinced I was going to change the world with this idea but I wanted to give send everyone who ordered Tefola on their website and we get we're not doing like tons. We're probably doing like a hundred orders every month. I wanted to send everyone a personalized video saying, thank you for your support after every single order. And my intern's like, um, she's like in school still. And she knew that that was a terrible idea. And like, <laughs> anyway, she was like, I mean, if you have time to do that, like, what are you going to say no to? So you can say yes to this. Mm, and I'm like, that's a great Great question, yeah. intern. She, <laughs> wise beyond intern. her years. So wise. Or she's just used to me having way too many ideas. <laughs> um, so that did not end up happening. Definitely for the best, Aww. for my sanity. Because Well, it's great to hear that Tafola is growing. It's it's like your baby is, is growing into a child, going to kindergarten and playing with the other kids yes. on the playground. <laughs> like you can't, you can't control what it's doing all the time, but you know, it'll grow um, into its own thing. I like that analogy a lot. <laughs> I like, yeah, other people are shaping its destiny yeah. or its future. Yeah. I love that. For the better, yes. hopefully. For the better. <laughs> I can't wait till it's like an angry teenager. Like what's going to happen there? Yeah, you'll have to come <laughs> back on the show in a few years when you're in all the Whole Foods across the country, when you're yes. shipping worldwide. And if any of your people do want to follow, yeah. so it's Eat Tefola, like E-A-T-T-E-F-F-O-L-A. And we are eattefola.com. Get a free sample of Tefola if you sign up for our newsletter list. So you can try it for free. You pay shipping, which is like $3. So nice. Yay. All right. Thank you so much, Jane. Had fun. And that is a wrap for our first episode of season two. I'd love to hear what you got out of this episode. Take a screenshot of the podcast and tag me on a story on Instagram. I'm at Inside Out with Jane. All right. I will see you back here next Tuesday. And in the meantime, I'll chat with you online. Bye.